in the chat or see me right now. Um, YouTube, Facebook, and uh, Twitch, all those cool places, man. What's up, everybody? Welcome to another episode of the Truth Seeker Podcast. Today, my guest is Taylor Remington. Taylor, welcome to the podcast, brother. How are you? Doing well. Thanks for having me on. I'm excited to be here, have some fun chats. So uh, hello to everyone. For sure, for sure, man. Good to have you. We uh, connected for the first time probably a month ago. Just, uh, you I guess, felt led to, to say what's up. And, uh, you know, you've been on my radar for years, I guess, running in the same or similar circles with uh, the Christian mystical movement. And so we know a lot of the same people, a lot of the uh, similar experiences and know what's going on um, in this realm. So I thought it'd be awesome to have you on. Pick your brain. You wrote a book about Christian meditation and I own Christian-meditations.com. So I was like, man, this is going to be a good talk. So um Excited to pick your brain and, and, and have a journey with you. So just let yeah. people know who you are, what you bring to the table. Just kind of give an introduction and uh, we'll start there, man. Yeah. Um, yeah. So hello, everyone. I'm Taylor. Um, uh, I mean, there's a lot, a lot that could be said, but just kind of like real brief. Um, I, uh, I guess, identify as, you know, definitely a Christian mystic and have been involved in. Um, within like the Christian uh, mysticism scene now for uh, about close to like 12 years around there. Um, I uh, got, I guess you could say saved when I was 19 um, on a mushroom trip, Jesus came to me and that kind of shifted my um, unfolding as you know, my trajectory moving forward into the future. And um about 12 years ago then, or yeah, around there, like 12 years ago, I I heard about this guy, Ian Clayton friend took me to his thing. And I, you know, I was like, okay, this is interesting. Kind of some next level conversation about different sort of Christian spiritual stuff. And that kind of really got the ball rolling for me personally. And, um, and then, uh, a few years later, I hooked up with, with Dr. O and, um, was really interested in like the Jewish mysticism because i my mom's side of the family is Jewish. And so I was really always kind of interested in exploring more of that sort of, um, aspect of, of my own background. Um, so, uh, connected and, and was learning under Dr. O for a long time. And, um, then, uh, you know, just through over the many course of many years, just exploring different things, got involved in different things. And, uh, eventually just led me to uh about i would say about eight or nine years ago i started like my own meditation journey um and at the time i didn't really know anything i just kind of just went for it and um that because i wanted more experiences i wanted to uh understand what was kind of happening in my own spiritual background different charismatic stuff because i got involved in like obviously the charismatic church and you know, what is prophecy and why is this house, how is this working? And I wanted to know kind of like what the function and how things were happening uh, within one's being. And then um, eventually just kind of studied and just got deeper and deeper and deeper into it. Um, and then a couple, two years ago, 2020, I finished my book, um, Beginner's Guide to Christian Meditation, where I take people through a number of different practices um and just kind of talk about the process of meditation and the process of what's taking place inside one's one's being while they're you know practicing or setting up to practice and so on and so forth um and now i just kind of uh you know i have i teach christian mysticism meditation as well and but i mean that's just kind of the like you know the microwave short version of kind of just my own background and uh, kind of where I've come from and, and where I'm going. So, um, but yeah, um, I have a big interest in religion and philosophy. I have a master's degree in religion and philosophy. Um, I'm really interested in um, the way that people understand the framework of reality. So a cosmological understanding, I'm really interested in metaphysics and uh, the process of, um, let's say, you know, spiritual science and, um, as well as just the structures of consciousness. And, and, uh, that really kind of spurred me to get my master's because I was, um, 
really fascinated. Obviously, the Eastern religions have a much deeper understanding of the mind and the aspects of the soul and whatnot that kind of the Western traditions in some respects um, were not totally, but to a certain degree, were less interested in in the way that a lot of the mystics wrote about certain things. Obviously, there are exceptions, but um you know it's it's smaller percentages whereas over there it was more of a an ongoing conversation that's been happening for you know 2500 years so um yeah do I dove into that to understand different things to be able to you know be, be to be able to better articulate and to be able to um intuit a better understanding of what's happening within the uh christian let's say dimension of reality and what what that looks like through christ and what that looks like through the holy spirit and what that looks like through um you know a trinitarian or within you know um a christ-centered cosmological framework so um yeah so that's kind of again like the short version but you know yeah um it's and, uh yeah in that uh, man i got so many questions so i'm trying to write down some pointers here just on your opening statement you know so we can just tap into it and uh, a, lot, a lot of good points that i like to just kind of open up even from that and i know that's how our conversation will go for the journey just kind of mapping it out because don't really have any preconceived things to, to to talk about just to get on here and just let the spirit flow so um natural yeah. interest i can't let you gloss over the uh the mention of finding Jesus or becoming a Christian uh, on a magical mushroom experience, a magic mushroom encounter. Was that a good trip or a bad trip? Was Definitely. it like this? Did you see Jesus on the mushrooms or was it like I, I got scared and it ran me to Jesus kind of thing? No, no, it was a completely blissful experience. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, I'd grown up like evangelical for the, like, but like nominal conservative evangelical. I didn't take anything serious at any capacity um and at that point in my life i was just kind of like in a down place emotionally and mentally and uh my friend was like hey let's just you know let's let's just do these and whatever and i was like whatever i wasn't even like a seeker mode or like anything at this point i was just like you know hanging out mm. and uh yeah i just had like this like bliss energy came over me and then jesus showed up and uh took me on like an inner journey <clears throat> where he uh, walked me through a bunch of different like specific traumas that had happened to me and um, like just these deep questions of like, how could this happen to someone or someone and so forth. And he just like basically showed me um, that he like loved me through all these different processes mm -hmm. that I had already gone through. And there was what, this what, like, what, uh, you, um, year was that? 2000 eight wow okay so you're yeah, og, so you're OG with, with this because this is definitely coming into the the limelight now i thought i was a um an og as far as talking about it from a christian perspective right like that's even yeah. an, a new thing but people are kirby is starting to talk to it but i, I remember doing a, a podcast um shh, what year was that man 2018 2019 uh, should christians use magic mushrooms and it was just there's not even a conversation for it but now we can do podcasts and have these talks and people oh yeah yeah much you know the science is there the uh you know the mm -hmm. proof is in the pudding you know those kind of things totally. but uh were you talking about it early on or was it hush hush and only for like the inner circle or my close friends kind of thing because yeah I, for sure like i didn't talk about it like demons because it obviously you know? <laughs> yeah and it, i mean i would probably say i became more comfortable talking about it like around 20 17 2018 around there um and do it to you just be like yeah this is just part of my journey and what happened and i mean at the time um i had a very like small view of what god could be and so the when i was on it it blew my really small framework of yeah. what i thought you, you know and it kind of it pulled me out of like even just a, a judgmental god like framework mm. it pulled me into just this pulled me really into what god is um so yeah 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 so um, 2008 and so um now with, with that experience like because set and setting is key with any type of with any anything in general if you're trying to um 
yeah you know have an encounter right the and i say that to ask you know the music cuz you know music is usually a big part of a uh you know ceremony um even mm-hmm. on sunday mornings when you go to church uh, the right songs are going to usher in the presence of god so like what kind of music were you listening to if any at all because we were listening to bethel at our like really going in deep and that was just like it was amazing it was so beautiful did you listen to worship music at all or no dude no like music. literally it was like i was at a frat house in san diego <laughs> Yeah. with like 25 other dudes that i didn't even know it was just oh, so it wasn't even a christian I... thing yeah no okay it wasn't wow. even yeah. a christian okay. thing and i i Set just and setting i'm trying to get i'm trying to put myself there yeah i know i agree yeah. with you um but for like i was like you know it was the complete opposite of where you would ever expect um <laughs> something like that to occur um and uh yeah. So, I mean, I'm like this frat house, like crying and there's all these dudes and whatever. And I just like having my own experience. And, you know, afterwards, my friend's like, dude, what happened to you? And I was like, oh, man, well, let's talk about it. It took me a couple of days to process it. Yeah. So, um, but yeah. That's what's up. And so, like, you know, just just kind of hovering here for a little bit, you know, you mentioned like him showing you Jesus coming to you and showing you this inner healing or this inner trauma where like, Hey man, I was there. I'm okay with that. You needed this to get to where you're going because you have now a compassion within you to reach those people and you'll know how to deal with it so you can heal other people. Um, the thing that came to me on, on mushrooms or, or, you know, I say on mushrooms is, you know, working with mushrooms, if you will, Mm -hmm. is to heal the healers. You get the healing yourself and then go out and, and become that healing for others and embody it. And um, the interesting thing is that I heard someone say that the the magic mushrooms kind of sync up with almost a 12 step program of this finding inner healing, finding peace, coming to terms and accepting your faults and all of that. But from a loving perspective, right, where you kind of get the get God's view of your situation versus your own view and, and what you've been told and those things. So um, going through that, that inner, inner healing and, and deliverance, if you will, can you talk just a little bit more about that release and how long it took to, you know, incorporate all of that stuff and what it felt like? Cause you hear different stuff. You, we hear about the machine elves who literally come and repair your DNA while you're in a trance kind of thing. There's, there's so many different stories of, how that happens yeah yeah um i mean for me my my personal experience um it definitely was like i don't know the way to put it but it was like the spirit came on me like the energy was was pure bliss and um it definitely i could feel it move into my soul and repair um you know a lot of different sort of emotional pain that i was carrying at that time um and again restructuring my mind in a way that um allowed me to see like that god is good um and that i had a a very unhealthy uh the idea of what god was and as a result of it Mm -hmm. um i was kind of living in this cycle of i don't know something dead in some capacity just because my framework was set up to me in this way that was you know, this author God was this authoritarian, um, you know, figure where if you don't follow this specific set of rules, you're going to go, you know, to this burning place for all eternity. That was what I was told as a kid. Right. And so it really shaped my reality, even though obviously I ended up like not necessarily buying the story at a certain point, but it's still, uh, it was still really hard for me to like break out of that sort of programming in some capacity. Um, but in this, it was like, I, I actually encountered, um, the nature of, of, of the divine, you know, energetic impulse and, um, it, it, it liberated me. And then it, you know, it, it sent me off basically to be like, Hey, you know, get ready. And there's a lot more to reality than just this material, you know, baseline consciousness that, you know, that we, we genuinely, generally have as we're kind of mechanically going through life Mm -hmm. so um so so what happens after that right you say it it led you to christ and uh you're already kind of growing up christian kind of thing um 
do you continue to use magic mushrooms um, after that? Um, what's your stance no. on them now? Yeah, it's been a while. It's been a long time. Um, I'm not definitely like, hey, no one should ever do it. I mean, mm -hmm. for me, in my personal journey, it was um, I really wanted to find the aspects that I had experienced on them in my being just because uh, and that's what really actually um, another part of the thing that pushed me into meditation is I wanted to be able to develop certain capacities yeah. within myself that um, that I could have access to at any you. time. Yeah. Yeah. I really, because everything's within me. Right. And I'm, yeah. I'm not anti at any capacity, but it's just for me and my own personal journey. Um, it's been about, okay, now about, um, Cause I mean, once as you go up, you come back down, although you're changed, but there's this like baseline thing of that. I'm trying to work through at, at this point in my life, um, at, at a deep capacity that's, um, within my own cosmological mental framework. So, mm -hmm. yeah. Um, I, I'm the same way, you know, I, I talk about them very highly because it, it really, you know, they, they helped me. Um, they were, you know, it's a medicine. You know, it's plant medicine, and uh, um, we need to talk talk about it from a Christian perspective, and maybe remove some of the taboo. But uh, with anything, you know, people become addicted, or or I say throw addicted out because it's kind of hard to get addicted to to mushrooms, like you're dependent on it or mm -hmm. something. But you become fascinated with it, and it, it loses its sacredness because it is a sacred, uh, uh, sacral um experience that i yeah. think we shouldn't it shouldn't become religious it shouldn't become um routine um because then that that thing that is so, so beautiful is now nonchalant um yeah so very hot it's it's beautiful because i know if i needed them or if they call to me i can go back to them at, at any time but as far as like having to continue to do it it was 2017 when i did it a hero dose as well and it changed my life wow. And I talk about it and I continue to talk about it. And I'm, I'm you know, it's, you know, I've caught flack from, from friends for talking about it. I've, you know, lost followers and people who got that to that part of my book get freaked out. I actually almost left two parts out of my book. I wrote my book, Spirit Realm, Angels, Demons, Spirits, and the Sovereignty of God. And as I was compiling all the chapters and just really, um, getting all the stuff out of me uh, that had to do with the spirit world and encounters and different types of beings that I've had come in contact with and their, uh, you know, where they pop up in the Bible type deal. Um, when I was writing that, um, I was almost done, but then the Christian uh, audience came back because I, you know, I was a Christian, but I had to go to, you know, the spiritual community. Cause if you read the comments now, there's Christians are like, you know, attacking this and this is demonic and that wasn't Jesus. That was a demon. Like there's literally people saying that in the comments. So obviously we couldn't have those conversations, but when you're trying to work through your stuff, you need to find somebody who is giving their life over to, to the study of this and, and, and try, try to make sense of it. So I, I went, you know, to the, the spiritual uh, new age community and, and got a lot of answers that I was able to come back and maybe articulate to the Christian uh, community. But um, Karina Pataki and Kingdom Talks and Chris Carter and many of these people started embracing me and my uh, anointing and my my scrolls, if you will, is what they would call it. And um, and so a bigger Christian audience like accepted me because they were ready for the conversation. But at that time of getting ready to finish the book, since I had all these Christians, I was like, man, I know the mushroom part is going to throw them off. So it was the mushroom part. With a big part of my journey, I say I stepped into full-time ministry because of working with ma magic mushrooms. And thats I know it sounds funny, but it's the truth. Um, it's so the magic mushrooms part and the alien part. And I was like, yeah, that's going to throw people off too. Summoning UFOs, asking for a sighting, and poof, these lights come out of stars and change your life. But I, like, um, so I, I tried to get some wisdom from Chris Carter, and I was like, bro, I'm thinking about leaving this stuff out, man, just because there's so many Christians that are now like, they're going to want me to come speak at churches and stuff. But if they read this, it's going to throw them off. And he, uh, so I didn't know I was starting to question and he was like, man, like we, we, we love you and we appreciate your work because you're the one who's not afraid 
to talk about this stuff. So you got to put it in there. Like, don't like sing to the choir now that, you know, you've got the listening ear again. Just, you know, be you, speak your truth, live your truth. And I put it in there and it's definitely helped a lot of people. It's uh, lit a fire of intrigue in many people, but it's also scared a lot of people and, and had them say, you know, all kinds of evil things about it. So that conversation yeah. with the Christian community can be very, very damaging. Have you, um, you said if you, you have, if you don't really talk about it a lot or, or stand for it, you, you really wouldn't get the, um, the backlash, but have you received any backlash in, in that area? Um, I just don't really talk about it. So that, that much. Um, so I, I guess in that sense, I don't, I'm not put in that position necessarily. Mm -hmm. Um, and, uh, yeah, cause I, I, I also am not like an overemphasis on like, Hey, everyone should do X or, or whatever. Um, I just more at this point, um, you know, is more about, Hey, this is part, this is an honest part yeah, of my journey sure. and where I, where I've come from. And, um, my understanding of it is going to be different than, you know, a Baptist kid or person who grew up in the deep South, who has a very, you know, limited view of the world based on, um, you know, what he's been told to think or what he thinks is good yeah. or what's bad. Uh, you know, for me, I, I have a completely different worldview perspective based off my own experience and based off of, you know, what, what the Holy Spirit's led me through. So, um, I don't necessarily expect them to understand, but at the same time, you know, things are changing fast, yeah. as you know, yeah. and, uh, these things are going to be part of the everyday conversation moving forward, especially in the future. I mean, all the top universities in America from yep. Harvard, Oxford, John Hopkins, UCLA, they're all doing, you know, crazy amounts of research and all this stuff. And they're yeah, finding, so cool. you know, obviously a lot of interesting things. So, yeah. um, we're entering into a new era and this is going to be definitely part of it. So, um, how the church or the Christian body at large responds to it is going to be interesting. Um, you know, I'm definitely sitting back, uh, gonna enjoy the show in some capacity but um it's it's uh you know it's here and it, people are it gonna takes, be more it takes aware the right it. person talking about it you know i seen mm -hmm. i seen a post from kirby on on his uh on his instagram he said something about it or posted a study that people were talking about it and all of the comments from a, a christian perspective everybody was like rooting him on like yeah man I'm, I'm glad people are finally talking about this and man if you Everyone listens to Joe, Joe Rogan, like uh, at least knows a little bit about him anyway. I've totally. heard something. And he's a huge advocate. Yeah. And so his his experiences. So that's going to that's going to force you to have the conversation. You can't like, no, 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 it's demonic. Well, there's that. But good luck if it's changing people's yeah. lives and that kind of thing. But um, I'm, I'm excited about where it's going. And, um, you know, and, and that's just the icebreaker. That's not even, you know, that's that's one thing. There's so many uh, things exactly. that that are um, that, that are ancient, that, that our ancestors had, I, I believe. And I think that the early Christians had at least the early prophets and, and seers and magi and all of these, uh, beautiful mystical people that we read about, um, in the scriptures and, in and antiquity. And you mentioned Eastern mysticism and looking to those other religions. And the more I do that, the more I'm faced with something that I tried to fight years ago of, of, um, thinking that like our practice was exclusive. And all other ways are a false way and an abomination unto God kind of thing. But I'm, the more research and the more honest I am with the research, Dr. Justin Sledge, you mentioned him, just reading these ancient books, like their, their practice is like very similar um, ancient Christian, Christian mystics to many of the other traditions that it was borrowed from and they were taking things and they we put a Christian spin on it. Uh, you can start with the holidays. You know, you can start with, you know, so much stuff that it's this conglomeration, but that used to be scary. But now it's, um, I think it's bringing me more of a, 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 I don't know about a piece, but more of an intrigue to look into those things. Because now that I know that they existed, now I can see them in the Bible where there was a mm -hmm. cognitive dissonance and I would read over it and it was hidden. It was, a, it was maybe, an inch deeper, it was maybe a foot deeper, but it was there the whole time. But my, um, you know, my brain, my experience, it, it, it would not allow me to see that. 
which you kind of mentioned of, of having this different view of God early on that didn't allow you to see this other healer, this other friend, this other um, ex explorer, you know what I'm saying, uh, aspect mm -hmm. of God. So um, that's one thing that's really cool about where we are and this information coming forward. So with your study on Eastern religion, tradition, metaphysics, all of that stuff you mentioned, um, how does that help? How does that reshape the Bible for you at all? Does it does that bleed into the worldview or is the Bible still separate holy men who were untainted by any uh, of the world kind of thing? What, what's your thoughts on that? Yeah, I mean, that's a great question. Um, I mean, for me, uh, it definitely obviously affects how I read the text, um, not in obviously I, I when Hey, I learned about this specific principle. I'm not going to necessarily say this is exactly what the Bible is saying, you know, whatever, but, um, it obviously definitely affects the way that, as you mentioned, you, you start to understand, you start to see things you wouldn't have seen before because, um, and, and a lot of people have a very rosy view of the Bible in general in terms of how it was constructed and how certain things kind of unfolded with it. I mean, it's definitely a, a holy divine text, whatever. I'm not, you know, disregarding it, but yeah. um, it, it came together over, you know, long periods of time and many people participated in its, um, its unfoldment, its creation in some capacity. Um, and, uh, you know, there's different perspectives there's different things that change there's different worldviews that change that are they're immersed in the text and when the israelites you know go to babylon there's certain things that come back in the text that weren't there before um for instance angel names angel names aren't existent until israel comes back from babylon in babylon they learn about angelic names so there's certain things that um israel borrows from the nations and they're influenced by as they come back um and then, of course, uh, the New Testament was, you know, highly influenced by Hellenistic Greek culture um, and, and Greek mysticism in some in some sense, um, as well as being unique. So uh, to what to what it brought to the table. So um, being able to understand these different things allows you to be able to to stand back and, and start to see how um, how these things are coming, how they came together, how the sausage let's say how it was created, how it's, how it's starting to come together. You start to see it. Um, but it does take you to different levels of understanding of certain phrases or certain things that like you mentioned that you would maybe just gloss over, or it didn't, it didn't make sense to you at the time. Oh, yeah. Um, and so it starts to, um, you know, impact you in a different way. It's, it, and it starts to reshape your understanding, um, in, in, in new ways. Um, so but yeah, it's what. So it, so you it, said like you know as you're reading this, you're finding out all these new things, these different things. It changes. Oh man, wow, they were really talking about this. Oh wow, Joseph was practicing a uh, dream inoculation. He was going to sleep at a holy place, and he had to, or Jacob and had this encounter, and this was a practice that they did where they would try to communicate with the spirits that were over that land, and there was a certain practice that you don't know about these things, and then you start reading them in the in the script when they would encounter God or angels or whatever, which like you said, Babylonian, Egyptian, Sumerian, Canaanite, Greek, all of these things that we're now reading. Oh, wow. And, and, uh, and some of that stuff changes or, or gives you a little bit more context or maybe not, but what is the thing that, that stays constant for you? We're talking about all these changes, right? You got to have some, some consistency, at least in your, in your mind and in your heart and in, in your spirit, because without that consistency, you couldn't righteously go back and look at all that stuff for what it is, see its influences on the scripture, on Christian culture, and, and be okay with it, right? You got to have something that's like your solid foundation. And we noticed that, yeah. you know, many people who don't have that, because when you found out that all of these documentaries that say, well, his whatever it is that goes against your your belief or your tradition and you find out that what you thought was true isn't and then when that's okay like that's okay yeah because I, I like as if i have it all figured out at whatever age you were when when you had your spiritual awakening or became a christian which we all thought 
think and thought we we were or are know it alls, you know. So what's yeah, constant I'm, for you? Uh, I mean, there's a couple things. Um, I would say the number one easy one is that God is love. Mm. That's that for me is constant. That's good. Like That's good. I start from that place, um, and so um, God is good and God is love. Um, uh, and I think even if you just start from that place and you and you live from that place, it, you know things will reshape your understanding of how you're reading and looking at things. Um, secondly, at, at least for me, I mean, um, you know, based off my own experience, uh, that Jesus was the incarnation of the Logos, which, you know, is a whole other thing. It's, it's a Greek metaphysical thing, but, um, you know, understanding that and um, that Jesus is the incarnation of the Logos. Um, as John says, the word, but it's not the, a lot of people think when John says in the beginning was the word there, he's like being like a Baptist preacher referring to the Bible, but it's referring to <laughs> the Trinity, a Greek metaphysical <laughs> principle of, you know, the, 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 the constructing, um, all powerful mind of, 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 mm -hmm. of God, of the God sphere. Mm -hmm. So that thing is the logos. Um, and that became our word for logic and other things like that. But, uh, so that thing incarnated, and uh became known as you know jesus christ um and of course you know i don't like i don't have a problem with the literalization that he died and rose again and all that like for me maybe for some people they just want it to be a symbolic story for me i don't have do, a problem with some do, of do so so it, so that's a constant and, and that's a thing uh does it how much does it change for you if it's not if it's not literal like, does it, does it like, haha, we told you so you're following a blah, 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 which is, you know, which, which is what you get. Yeah. And, and that scares a lot of people. And you got to come to terms at some point. What if it is uh, Caesar's Messiah? What if it is this? What if it wasn't? What if it was just a recycled story of Tammuz? What if it was a recycled story of um, the Bhagavad Gita and all of those? It's a compilation. Right. Like, what if it is? Does that? Does that change anything for you? Or if it's like, hey, business as usual, even better? Uh, yeah, I mean, from a, from the realm of the symbolic world, I don't have a problem with it living as a literal symbol. Um, and uh, and if it is, let's just assume, let's just say for a second, it's just that for me, it doesn't really change. But I will say that um, it's difficult when you have experiences uh and so like let's let's just throw this word out there gnosis when you get gnosis gnosis is a direct experience of something that moves beyond theory and into an experiential um embodied uh awareness of something that you didn't know before and so when you take on that gnosis um it moves kind of away from theory in a certain sense and into something let's say that vibrates with um something let's say akin to reality and so when you're in that space of reality uh there are these things and i and the being of jesus christ i have experienced as um is not necessarily just something as a symbolic representation but as something that that moves beyond it now maybe it's been so imbued by people that it became that but um from my own uh intuitive and my own personal sense mm -hmm. uh it's something that that kind of moves beyond theory and into something that's um i guess you could say in in the realm of reality based off of my own um encounter with certain aspects that are not just because hey someone told me x or because someone told me y mm -hmm. but because i because i have thrown everything on the table i have said yeah you know, I, I'm willing to deconstruct anything. And I have, um, I've let go of everything. Um, and, and I, and it, that's a big part of my practice too, all the time is to be able to, um, adapt, but, um, so, but I mean, I think the most important one is that, you know, that God is love. Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, working from that framework yeah, and what that produces outwards, I think is even just the message that, yeah. um, that Christ was living 
and you know what that means for each and every single one of us to a certain and what, whatever it means to, to every single one of us will will mean to that on an individual level yeah it and, and that's that's so funny that you know i give you the the floor to tell me your constants you know this was your this was your chance to run through all your doctrine and you literally name like three things that are near and dear and precious to you when I, I, you know, there's other conversations that would be, well, you know, that uh, the Trinity is the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. And there's, you know, Jesus died, was born of a virgin. Like, oh, well, maybe that's all in the literal story. I don't know. But but that changes, too. Like I said, the more that you read and the more of these things. Um, but but you, I'm with you on, on those on those constants, especially love. Um, I can see how now the story of, of Christ um the story of the Messiah um, could show up and, and reveal itself to people by many names. You know what I'm saying? Um, as far as love and accept, it, it, his name doesn't have to be Jesus for me. Like if I don't even think his name is Jesus. I don't think he ever heard that name in the in the physical. Uh, you know, maybe Yeshua, Yeshua ben Yosef. You know what I'm saying? Uh, Emmanuel, God with us, right? So to say, now his name is Jesus, and if you don't get it right, you're not saved or you don't believe in the rapture and these things, but um, you know that that love is a is a, is a big one, and I just see how. I I don't know. I just I, I I've I've studied syncretism for a very long time, as far as like, because I've studied what separates us. You are a chosen people, a royal priesthood. You're not like the world. Don't become like them. Don't learn their ways. You know, and then you get to a point to where hey we. We already learned their ways, and then now we're learning these these new ways of another tradition, and we're forgetting where we came from, kind of thing. So, um, you know, I think it's with foundation, but the foundation is love. It's got to be. It is. Mm-hmm. It that's what Christ represents. Like love, I, I try to say as as easily as I can for anybody. Uh, think of the highest form of love, logos, right? That became a person. If love became a person and came to earth and interacted with humanity, that's who and what he is. And he gave up himself and taught us how to love and um, imparted his love, right love, all of those things. So, yeah, um, no, for sure. Um, I think all those really great questions. I think when you get into like, you know, the mysticism and you get into inner parts of Christianity, no one's afraid to ask these questions. And I think asking these questions or at least having a conversation about things is important. Um uh and it allows us to then self-reflect upon our own process of belief and why we hold on to certain things Mm -hmm. that we hold on to and um also at the same time it allows us to um you know maybe encounter uh christ in new ways um to to encounter you know the father or or whatever word you want to use for it in new ways um, but, uh, you know, being able to hold oneself open is important. Um, but I think the most important thing is, you know, like, like we mentioned is hold, hold that place in love and, and, you know, um, from my own, you know, from my own journey, um, you know, I've, I think what's, uh, one of the more interesting aspects when you start studying, was you know when you start studying other religions obviously you 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 start to find um especially in mysticism you you start to find commonality um amongst mm-hmm. different religious groups or whatever and and obviously there's um uh a, a, a dance of, of certain sorts that is um a brotherhood a dance that is familial that is yeah um together but at the same time so for me in my own personal journey, I, you know, I definitely went through like, um, uh, maybe I like in certain sense, maybe for a hot second, I was like, man, maybe I'm just a perennialist, like all roads lead to the same thing. And I, and I don't have a problem with people hold to that, but I will say though, that in the future that is going to be, and it already is being academically pulled apart. And the reason is, is that, um, your, you're assuming basically that indigenous religions are the same as Buddhism. And so you're now telling an indigenous, you know, native American that their religion is no different than Buddhism. And that's actually disservice to both groups. So um, now there may be an aspect where they're connecting to certain similar energies in some capacity. Um, 
but there's, there's, there's this thing called the participatory movement, which is actually, I would consider it the next turning of like the, the awareness of like this multi-religious world that we're living in this planetary world where there's all these different groups and your neighbor can be Buddhist and your neighbor can be Hindu. And this is a completely different world that our grandparents lived in. And so things are evolving much faster. Yeah. Um, but one of the things is this participatory reality, which for me then kind of like pursued, like was big, my big push was, okay, I, I can recognize my brotherhood with all of these groups. And I do, and I hold them all in my heart dearly, but at the same time, I'm like, okay, now what is this thing that I call Christianity that I'm a part of? What actually is what makes it, let's say a unique flower in the garden mm -hmm. of God. What is that? Why is this flower? What is the uniqueness of this flower? Not to say that, like you mentioned, like, Hey, there's only one flower, but to say that, um, you know, what is this thing about Christ? What, what, this is, what is this aspect of the Holy Spirit? What is this aspect of, uh, these things that Paul experienced that the disciples experienced that infuses one's being in this dimension or in this, in this space that we hold, um, near and dear within our own being like what what is it about it that that creates its own uh let's say flavor but also then holding at the same time on the other hand what are the things that we can then come together at the same table and have a conversation um and begin to talk about the divine nature amongst all these other groups of people and being able to hold their uniqueness within uh within value um, while at the same time, you know, seeing that they're going through a different process and it's going to unfold them in their own capacity, because, you know, someone who, who's practicing, let's say shamanism in the Amazon is going to have a completely different experience of reality than, you know, some Baptist kid in the Midwest, um, or, um, and a Muslim kid in Saudi Arabia, who, you know, lives around the corner from Mecca or something like these are three completely separate um, sort of things that they're connected to that are creating a sort of experience of reality. But what happens when you bring them to the table and what in a healthy way and what, yeah. what, what sort of conversations and things? And I um, that's my and, podcast. <laughs> yeah, exactly. That's your podcast. And I, and I think that that's 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 what's so fun is the area that what we're coming into is actually fun and exciting because we're, it's going to be less about fear. Um, and truly moving into the Pauline language, you know, perfect love casts out all fear. And what does perfect love yeah. look like in yeah. a conversation, um, amongst these groups. And for me, that that's been a big part of my personal journey. So, okay, how do I come from this point of view and dimension? And, and, um, and maybe because I, I grew up with like a multi-religious DNA inside of me in certain, certain sense. I'm, I, I was always fascinated by that. Um, you know, cause Christians are very quickly. Okay. They, they just immediately accept Judaism because you know, it obviously came out of it, but then that's it, you know? Um, uh, and, but there's a multi-religious conversation that can happen between these two groups, but, but nothing else. Um, so, but I think once as we, we start to understand those things and we can understand what's happening inside our being when uh, let's say the, the Christ energy or the, or, or when, when the Holy spirit infuses our being or when the logos comes into our being, like, what does that mean? And how does that develop us? And how does that, what does that look like? Yeah. But then also at the same time, then, you know, let's say someone who's really meditating on the Buddha nature, again, not in a negative way. I'm not talking about this yeah. in a negative sense, but like, how does that develop one's being yeah. and, and how do then, you know, we come together amongst this, yeah. uh, you know, I, great you know, mixture of things. That are taking I, I place. found it, um, you know, beautiful. It's just what I, what I have because I, the, to honor, you know, and it's for true seeker honors people that kind of, you know, you hear that a lot, but um, to, you mentioned Ian Clayton. And so many other people, Dr. O, you mentioned all these Christian mystics who are kind of like forerunners. Now they're becoming um, experts in breath work and uh, Christian breath work and stuff. But uh, that had, that breath work, it had to come from somewhere. It had to be, it had to, um, it had to, somebody practiced it for a long time before they were able to start totally. writing, writing books on it and, and sharing it openly. And whether, you know, there was, 
even before Wim Hof, you know, there was many people in my life that uh, that taught me breath work, and it was something beautiful to engage um, the Holy Spirit in, in my own nature and in my body and the somatic gospel. And man, the Holy the Spirit is the breath, holy, unclean spirit, whatever spirit you got, it is breath. But to pay homage and to not to be like, hey, this is don't do it like those guys. We this is Christian breath work. And it only and so now you got this new thing that is very ancient. But instead of like saying, yes, there was uh if you look into um pranayama, holotropic totally. breathing, uh rebirthing breath work, you like you can't mention those names because you gotta corner the market. And and that's totally. where the and that's where the uh you know the paying homage is. If I'm cornering the market, I'm not gonna mention your name. I don't want you to go to them. I want you to come to me. So even with our, our Christian thing going a little bit further, I really, you know, I think it's, no, I, I totally got to learn from the people who like came well, before I, I versus think, saying it's tainted or something. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. I mean, the, let's just, let's just put it on the table. Like white Western culture <laughs> likes to colonize things. <laughs> Come on, man. And likes to say, hey, I discovered this land. No one was, oh, look, there's other people here. We yeah. discovered it. Yeah. You know? Um, Found it. So that, <laughs> it wasn't lost. It, yeah. And, uh, you know, it, it's something that we have to get better at rooting out within ourselves. And I think um, people are afraid that uh, that they'll lose you know, certain audiences or certain, you know, things that happen and, um, or they don't want, they don't want people to know that like, Hey, this did originate from these great mystics that lived in this other region. Um, and you know, but you have to deal with the historical process of where it came from. Um, and I do think that we, I, I totally agree. I think that we have to, uh, honor you know the lineage of all of these things that um are now being seeded into the west you know wim hof he exactly said isn't the first person to discover to use his breath um you know he's you know made it popular for sure you know made it popular so um but i you mean know, you kind of uh, you, you, you need those vehicles though i do understand that like you need a you need a um um a whoever a uh, Ian Clayton or a Kirby or whoever that's kind of got some pull or some leeway with with a certain demographic Christian mystics, I guess, to introduce them to it. Like a certain people, you know, if, if Wim Hof teaches it, ah, it could be demonic. If your favorite Christian author teaches it. I mean, we've seen this since the beginning. We got Perry Stone talking about, you know, uh, vibrational frequencies and uh, cymatics and you know, ma magic mushrooms, those guys are going to be forced to talk about this. The church mm -hmm. is going to be, and I say those guys, the church, the church mm -hmm. is going to be forced to talk about same sex attraction and, and, and be forced to talk about so many things that they're trying to stick their head into the sand for, or try to say it's easy as it's just demonic. We can pray it away or don't touch that. Well, maybe, um, but you know, people, you have to have a catalyst, a catalyst. So I do appreciate that. And I do understand if Chris Carter, you know, says, yes, I watched Jordan Maxwell's teachings on the Maseroth and on the Zodiac, and it really helped me. I know that because I am that, right? Uh, as soon as you mention that, it, we're, we're going to another program. There's another video right next to this one that they'll click. And they, they've been doing it every time we mention yeah. a buzzword or something that's kind of challenging. Um, but that's those people, the people who stay on board. And even if they get that check in their spirit, you're like, you know what? Let me just listen a little bit longer. Yeah. Let me see. And obviously that's how God deals with us. But um, I, I just, uh, yeah, yeah, I'm no, learning definitely. so much by, by understand. It's helping me understand the Bible more, man. You know, totally, totally. And I think we, we have to learn these technologies that we've had for to, to hack the body and different things that we've had for a long time. Um, it's very clear that the prophets were doing this in the Old Testament. Uh, there's a story of um, Elijah sticking his head between his knees um, 
and doing certain, uh, we don't quite know exactly what he was doing, but he would put his head between his knees. He put his head down and obviously you got your blood rush into your head. Um, Laying on the side for so, like sleeping yeah. on the slide for size for so many days. And with that, that's a, there's yeah. a practice where your heart will shift closer to the center of your, your chest by laying on your side for so many days. It's some wild stuff and not saying that that's exactly what it is, but it opens up that room for a rabbit hole and for you to go down it, which you may go down it by yourself because nobody else is doing it, you know? Yeah. Yeah. No, I think, um, I, you know, I, I think that we, we, as a community, I think Christian misses the Christian mystic community, um, uh, as a whole, we one of the things I think we can improve upon is, um, uh, and I'm speaking, you know, from I'm not just pointing the finger, but myself, we can get better at, you know, saying, hey, this is where I learned this. Uh, hey, I learned this from so and so, even it's from even if it's from another fellow uh, colleague, whatever you want to call yeah. it to a certain extent. Hey, thanks. Hey, I learned Yod Hey Vav Hey chanting from Dr. O. Like, Thanks, you know, not that you have to say it every time, but, mm -hmm. um, or, Hey, the you, courts you, you of nev heaven, you never get to teach the it. courts of heaven. Yeah. I learned this from Ian Clayton. Like, I mean, the amount of people that have, you know, claimed that that, that was their thing when it was very clear that he was the first person to bring that out is like very funny to me. Cause I was there in the beginning when he did it. And I watched a lot of people, you know, meme it, um, and never give any sort of, um, respect. So, mm -hmm. uh, you know, this is something that, uh, we as a community have to get much better at is explaining, Hey, this person has helped me. This person has been a part of my journey. Um, and, uh, and then uh, honestly, we can, then we can actually grow. Otherwise then we just, then we really kind of just isolate ourselves more and more. So. Yeah. I, I think honor is definitely uh, a big part of it, you know, but, but then again, it, it quickly becomes, we don't know where it came from. You know, like very like after two or three people, you know, we we don't know unless we unless we are bookworms or we're doing the knowledge and doing the research, which to be honest with you, most aren't, you know, especially in the Christian mystic movement. Many are are just uh, very driven by experience. And so hold on. Where does this experience come from? Is it brand new? Is it in the Bible? No, it's not. It's new. So, well, yes, it, it's actually in the Bible. You just. You just had you didn't have the context to see where it came from first. I love that stuff, like because if I see them doing it, then I know I can do it. Um, but but the more study, like I said, it, it, it so much that you're reading, you're like, oh wow, he was doing a form of that, working with spirits. You know, that was a big one of looking at some of the terminology that Paul was getting into and that I'm studying now. That's just blowing my mind that I never saw. And I don't know, I've never heard anyone speak on it just about him working with spirits and being able to send out a spirit on somebody. And he was doing that to the to the Christians, sending doing magic against them and sending spirits to go mess with them and stuff. And and Christ pulled his card and, you know, it's, hey, why are you doing this? And and I'm going to send a spirit on you. That's going to make you blind for so many days, uh, which was him. Um, and we know that Paul can eventually Paul did that to another another um, magician uh, eventually in the New Testament where he was able to make that send out a spirit and make this person blind for so many so many uh, days uh, or a season and breaking down those words to let you see the spirits that he was working with because but but not in a biblical context because it's a con confine of just we don't see this before unless we look up culture and context oh wow there was a there was a thing that they were doing where they would let send spirits out. And that's just something that's really got my mind blown. That was this freaking amazing gem that I've, you know, we're talking about angels, the names of angels, um, you know, mentioning channels like Esoterica, who's like, okay, yeah, this book's like, these were ancient Kabbalistic books that if you were a Pharisee, if you were somebody deeply rooted, you knew the mysticism, not saying that you had to practice it, but you knew it because this was common commonly known by even the, the Essenes in the early early church and not even them. Just go to the Greeks and see what they were doing that were that were very similar. These guys were were trading secrets, man, and they were all you know had their own schools of initiation, but it just keeps adding. 
It yeah. just keeps adding. I love it. I find it beautiful myself. I love it. No, for sure. I think that's what's fun about the you know going back to the Bible or the scriptures or whatever you however you want to you know whatever word you want to use for it. Mm -hmm. um, you know, is it definitely grows with you. Like the more that you grow, it grows with you. And so it's a, it's definitely alive. It, it, and yeah. the things that you read, a, you know, maybe, you know, 500 times and then one day, bang, it's just like, oh, whoa, this hits me and I am starting to understand it now. Um, definitely. So, uh, yeah, I, I think that, uh, you know, we're, we're definitely you know, to use that word again, we're definitely, you know, growing into a participatory uh, Christian aspect where we're going to be, you know, our mysticism involves all of these other elements um, that we're going to be working with. But for me, where I'm at and working with people is, or one of the aspects is really getting people to understand, you know, who and what they are. And I'm that and, and beginning from that place. And then obviously people can do whatever they want to do if they want to do all these other things um, or whatever, they don't have to do this. But um, uh, where I'm, where I'm at is like really interested in like the deep, like the, the higher aspects you could say of the soul, the part where it says you're seated in heavenly places, mm -hmm. uh, but not in like a way that's just like, Hey, yeah, I'm just, you know, in this heavenly world, but actually talking about it from a, uh, a meta mind perspective where we're talking about something that um, uh, goes beyond um, our current understanding of who we think we are, but then that allows it to, you know, us to move into the, um, into the actual created nature that, that God had for us. Mm -hmm. And um, so that's so, kind of where okay. I'm personally at with but that. Just because we're talking about syncretism and, and these other outside sources and stuff, what has been something that's helped you um, articulate that or see it as a constant? Um, has it been other traditions? Like, I mean, obviously I'm no, I'm no expert, but looking at like the Greek tradition where you had the evolution of the soul and the, so it was the, soul drops into the ego and goes through this experience it's like an evolution or um it's uh, the bible would say adam was a, a a soul but it's becoming a spirit and christ was a spirit so it's a soul uh making its way to be transitioned or transformed back into a spirit which is where you originally came from i think all religions bring a piece of that puzzle ha do you look into any of that or has it just been through meditation of your own like seeking both. that way or the bible yeah or? i mean for me i hold both like definitely deep practice and try to experience it as much as i can and then also at the same time uh reading other things i mean i think um i think the buddhist concept of the non-self for me mm -hmm. was extremely influ influential and a lot of christians don't really have any idea of what they mean when they say non-self mm -hmm. Um, they assume that it's like pure nihilism, but that's not necessarily what it's talking about. It's like co, um, co original, um, arising. So basically it means that you can't, you're, 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 you're so connected to everything that, um, you can't necessarily put a substance. It becomes an event ontology as, as opposed to a substance ontology. So this is kind of a shift in Western thinking, but basically you're moving from, um, I am the soul that's the substance to I am this event that's taking place um, that's connected to um, all of these other things in creation. So, for instance, um, you know, if this sun goes out right here, uh, the earth is going to burn up, but we're in relationship to the sun and, um, you know, we would die. Our bodies would die if that sun went out. Um, and so this is something that you exist, you are in partnership and your body exists because of the sun being there. So this is kind of the non-self in the Buddhist conversation as they recognize, whoa, 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 because I'm in relationship to this, I can't necessarily say I'm an independent ent entity that's completely separate from all these other things. I am a interconnected being to all of these things. And as a result of me being interconnected to all these things, I'm a self and not a self at the same time, which is a non-self. It basically is a middle it's a middle realization. It's an event ontology to say that you do exist, 
but your existence is also dependent, let's say, on all these other things that are now dependent on everything. So everything is in this matrix of relationship, you could say, is in this matrix of interconnectedness. So that's kind of been that aspect, obviously, that on, on that side. Um, and then the Greek understanding and then the Jewish understanding um, has been, you know, a big influence on me as well. The Jewish understanding of the soul, uh, the, you know, the, the Chaya, Yechida, the Neshama, the Ruach, um, and uh, the Nefesh, which are like the five aspects. And then, as you mentioned, the Greek aspect, um, which is more dealing about the noose, um, which, which for me is, is really interesting. The aspect of the noose, which is the word that you see sometimes translated as mind and the new Testament, mm. but it's a really interesting, um, point of conversation that's actually happening in the new Testament in the original language. You don't necessarily see in the English, but it's actually part of this ongoing conversation amongst these other sort of mystics in that in the Levant or the Mediterranean area at the time, which is understanding this, um, higher aspect of one's being, um, that, uh, has the, has the ability to perceive things according to um, the divine vision. And um, so that that sort of Greek component is very influential. The Jewish component is very influ influential, some of the Buddhist things. Um, obviously, some of the Vendata Hinduism, I think, is interesting um, about like, you know, the soul being a microcosm of the macrocosm. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah, you see, there's so many... There's so many, uh, there's so many things. There's so Silver many things, linings. Right? It's, I think it's beautiful because we've been fighting against each other. I mean, I was a street preacher, man. You know, I was a Turner Burn dude for so many years and this is ours and every, and this is mine. And if it, if it doesn't line up with this, then throw it out and that kind of thing. But to see like the whole time that, you know, we just had our portion, you know, maybe when, I don't know when it happened, when God divided, uh, or the gods or whoever divided the, the lands and the Tower of Babel and confused the speech and confused the language. And and now we have these different, um, I would say, you know, God poured out his spirit on all flesh, as Joel, the prophecy of Joel says. But I think that the way that we interact with that spirit, the way that we have uh, made schools on how to interact with it and rules and regulations and do's and don'ts over the years, um, somebody's mentioned it wants me to ask you about kundalini and those things and i you know i'm just a very uh i'm, I'm of the mind that it, we could be talking about the same thing and they just have different rules with it and what it can do and i mean the same is to be said just simply in christianity what the holy spirit can do what his name is you can't call him holy ghost the ghost is a disembodied person um he can heal you he can't talk to you anymore the miracles are done away with so this evolution of here's this creative life force energy that loves you, that is a teacher, that is a friend, that is and becomes, it feels like whatever you want it to be, which I think such is God. If you think that God is mad at you and angry and wants to kill you and hates gay people, then guess what? In your reality, he that's what it, it morphs itself to. Hence the I am that I am and I will be whatsoever I will be. But um. I think having that healthy foundation, like you said, about about love, and if it speak not according to this this doctrine, the doctrine of love, yeah. the doctrine of grace, the doctrine of the the beauty of of what the gospel represents, I would say because it is good news. You know, what what would yeah, you say no, just, about, sure. just about just about because you, you you did mention you know different terms and stuff like that too. You know, we call it just because we call it this doesn't mean it isn't that. Sorry, specifically to which thing? Um, maybe Kundalini. Just you know the idea okay. of Kundalini, or you know we mentioned breath work, and you know yeah. don't call it breath work, call it Holy Spirit work, you know, kind of thing. Yeah, um, I mean Kundalini is a very <laughs> touchy subject, especially <laughs> in the Christian community. Yeah, now um, for sure. Oh, if you know, you could. So yeah, I mean, I, I don't mind talking about it. I just have to, I'm just thinking about how exactly I want to frame it up. Yeah. Um, could could a, could a Christian do kundalini yoga and connect with the Holy Spirit? 
Why not? Sure. Why not? I don't have <laughs> like I, I encountered Jesus on mushrooms. So yeah. th- of course, like th- I think we um, a lot of these things require understanding of who a human and what we are. We don't even have an we are so detached from our bodies that we don't even know how energy is flowing inside of us. So if you don't even know how energy is flowing inside of you, how can you even to talk about whether or not this energy exists in the body or not? Because if you don't even know how energy is flowing in you, you can't talk about Kundalini, period. Yeah. End well, of sentence. Well, well, what about, can you, I don't think you're qualified to really talk about the Holy Spirit. Yeah, because the, the Holy Spirit is an, an incredibly embodied energy. Um, and so we in the West, especially Christianity, we were really detached from our bodies. We're really detached from... Um, and as a result of us being detached from our bodies, we're actually detached from our soul. We're really just caught up only really much in like the persona ego sort of experience of reality. Um, and, you know, that's, pr- that's also producing the next, you know, the VR sort of thing that we're pushing into, which is, you know, once as we actually completely detach from awareness of our body, then you, then you move into some sort of matrix. But, um, but we we're already we've already created this like weird bifurcation inside of us due to sort of a, a whole host of things, um, and so because we don't really know ourselves, uh, these things become very scary, um, and obviously they're framed up in another religious context. Now let's let's just talk about in the Jewish tradition, um, the. Uh, what people would call kundalini is a different thing. Now, um, the difference out. So here, so there's similarities. So let's talk about the similarities first. So the similarities let's talk about in Judaism and, and kundalini stuff is that there is an energy that exists at the base of the spine period. End of sentence. It's in every single human. It exists. There's not some sort of magical thing. Only those who are Hindus have this sort of energy there. Um, in the Jewish tradition, it sits in the yes ode, which is, um, which is the altar place of the divine manifestation within the human being. Um, and so from this place, the energy sits. Now, what you do with the energy is what you do with the energy. It is a canvas. It is a blank canvas of pure potential that you can shape in any capacity that you want to. So um, how you end up working with it is how you end up working with it now. Um, and when you move the energy upwards to the point within someone's head, uh, let's, you know, out of the crown, um, there are certain experiences that do occur and we see, and I'm going to be exactly like those guys in those conspiracy videos. Yes. The Toronto revival was that energy. That's why the people were chirping like dogs and cats and birds. So they were right. However, what they don't realize is that the energy that's there is actually a, a heavily subconscious energy. It's an energy that um, deals with these certain aspects within our being that, uh, you know, if, if certain people aren't necessarily ready for, it can, it can cause psychological and physical damage. And there are plenty of written examples from the Hindus themselves that say you need to be very careful. Why? Because this is pure power this is pure potential of of any sort of energetic force let me let me um, stop you there and, and just interject really quick just throw this thought yeah. out there um those writings those those warnings i think are applicable for any charismatic church that needs to be written as well because we we look at it as something different like that whole different or oh, that kund, th- there's a respect for the kundalini Oh, don't be careful now because you can hurt yourself. There's no respect for the Holy Spirit because oh, he's a gentleman. The Bible says he's a gentleman. He'll never hurt you. But the Bible has these little subtle warnings about don't put your hand to the plow and look back. Uh, don't tap in and and look back because you're, you know, don't get rid of your sp- lower spirits because a, a stronger one will come and get you and could take residence and the weird stuff. I know you've been in the charismatic movement long enough to know that it is full of delusional people that because oh, they don't, sure. because they don't say, kun, kun, listen, if I go into church and say, Hey, everyone, the kun, we're going to do Kundalini breath work. And this is what we're going to do. And the Kundalini told me that an angel is going to show up and the angel's name is Sephiroth. And 
It's going to scare people. But anybody can go in there and do that and say the Holy Spirit. The, and Or I can go in and say the Holy Spirit told me to leave my wife and go be with the so-and-so, this new lady at church. Like, And right. that's okay because God told them. Was, Hold on. You may be delusional. Like this energy, God told me to tell you this. You need to leave your wife. God told me that you're going to die. I had to tell you. Parking lot prophecy. We know how quickly the Holy Spirit, and I don't like how we throw that on the on the Kundalini. Like, be careful because it might hurt you. I'm like, listen, be careful with the Holy Ghost because he's more holy. He's holy. He's there. There's there's a when you awaken well, the Kundalini, there there comes a level of sanctification that I have to walk in. I have to opt. I have to be okay. If it tells me to quit smoking, guess what? I gotta quit smoking. Yeah. Same thing. No, I, and I, I will feel say, like it's I will applicable. Say, yeah, I'm not saying it from a charismatic point of view. I'm talking about from actually reading the Hindus. Yeah. You no, know, no, no, no. When I, they I'm, talk I'm, about no, it. I'm with you, but I think I'm just saying. I think it needs. I think the Christians who are listening need okay. to know that the same is applicable. You know what I'm saying? Like, no, it, for it anything, needs. anything. But it, that's why. That's why I said we have to know ourselves and we have to take it bit by bit. I mean, for me, I don't necessarily see the Holy Spirit and the Kundalini is exactly the same. I do see that the Holy Spirit is uh, produces the body's energy that gets known as the kundalini at a certain point but again different for instance in the jewish tradition um a similar word for that sort of energy in the body would be the shekinah or the shekinah is what people would say that's the word for it so in the jewish tradition the the, she, the shekinah actually moves down the body through a similar process if not the same process that you would see in other sort of diagrams um, but again, these things aren't said because, hey, this is some like some like black magic guy said this or whatever. This is done through just quiet introspection and being able to sense and be able to feel one's being. This isn't knowledge that's coming out of um, an experience with the dark spirit. This is an experience of actually being able to touch one's own self and to be aware of one's own self. And then you see it as it is. So this isn't information that's coming from way left field. This is actually information that's coming from that place of experience. Um, and, and I think, you know, one of the basic things that you can experiment with is just see how your body responds when you say these specific things and see, see how the energy responds when your body responds, when you engage, let's say the Holy spirit and what are the subtle differences? Again, not to say that one thing's negative and one thing's better, but you're right. You do have to be careful with anything, not careful in the sense that, it's bad, but in the sense of, um, you do need a sense of groundedness inside yourself in anything that you're doing. Like if you're, if you're just way, you know, gone way over here, then, you know, whatever it ends up being is just going to keep cycling in that. But we, we have to be conscious of ourselves first. You have to know your own being first. You have to know that you exist. You have to move out of, let's say, let's use a modern terminology. You have to quit being an NPC. You know, you, you have to move out of this mechanical consciousness and into the reality of being like, you know, there's a great saying by Gurdjieff, life is only real when I am. Um, and so this sort of thing we have to step into and then become sensitive to, but, um, but yeah, you know, long story short, energy exists inside the body. The energy moves downwards and it moves upwards. And so does your blood. Your, and that's a basic example. Your blood moves out from your heart and it comes back into your heart. Well, breath uh, too, right? the, in and out. Up yeah, and the out. breath, it comes in and it comes out. These are the, just the paradigms that exist. Um, so what you end up doing with it is what you end up doing with it. So, um, yeah. Yeah, Kundalini. That's kind of my. Well, yeah, Kundalini. It's, you probably would probably do better with saying just uh, go, uh, bridging it from a different tradition, like just without even saying Kundalini, because those guys, I mean, they say it, you know, where there's tachyon energy in Egypt or or ki energy, kinetic chi energy, life force. Um, you know, the um, Native American have a Americans have a different name for it as well. Um, this interactive spirit that is your intuition that speaks from the gut that will lead you into all truths that um that is that that light that lighteth every man that is christ that comes into the world i believe like that conscience that 
um, speaks to you. But like you said, what do you do with that conscience? Do you sear it with a hot iron? When it tells you to do something, do you tell it no? That's quickly how you be, you become calloused. That's quickly how you become, it doesn't function anymore like it used to. It becomes religious routine or, or duty. And uh, I think, like you said, knowing yourself and, and knowing that this is, a, this is a life, this is a song and dance, this is a relationship. And, and, and knowing that relationship. But but I think that, you know, what we call Eastern mysticism or meditation or whatever is key because that allows you to shut up and get honest and listen and be honest with yourself. What am I chasing? Oh, wow, too much of that. Wow, I need to turn the TV off for a while. It's like it's really, for me, like a meeting with God. You know, you call it prayer and meditation for me go hand in hand. You know, it's 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 totally Matthew same. six and seven, you know, five, six and seven. When you pray, go in and shut the door, get in the secret, go into your prayer closet and the father who will speak with you and like a very healthy rendering process of the things that we're carrying that uh, um, is, is, is amazing. And, and we have to do it. It's not again, it's not if you pray, it's when you pray. Like, what are some of the, the if there's a, a, a technique or a, uh, a visionary experience that, that people can tap into if they're beginners for this? What is something that, that you do? Are there different levels when you incorporate breath work? Or is there just, is it quieting the mind? Do you focus on something? What happens for you? Or is it different each time? Are there many modalities that you can choose from when you go into what we would call Christian meditation or mm -hmm. intimacy in prayer? And I'm saying those in one breath because to me they're the same, but they may be totally different for you, right? Totally. Yeah, actually the answer was the last thing, that there's a whole host of things. Um, with my meditations, uh, sometimes it's what I call imaginal practice, which is engaging, you know, active creation within the mind sphere of, of images. Um, sometimes it's quieting the mind. Sometimes it requires certain aspects of breath work. Um, Sometimes, um, you know, it's centering prayer aspects. I mean, there's like probably like, you know, if people are listening that, that are on my thing, they'll know like, you know, maybe a hundred different things or 50 different things that, you know, we'll <laughs> yeah. work through. So there's just a, so many different things. But for me, when I sit down, um, you know, I, I usually, you know, I, there's just, it depends on how I intuitively feel in the moment. But I think for people that are starting off, um, I think one of the best things that anyone can start at this time right now is to start feeling their body. Cause what a lot of people don't realize is that, um, is that, uh, your body is psychosomatic. It actually has the ability to feel spiritual things. It has the ability to sense things. It has the ability to discern. It has the ability to, um, engage with the whole, uh, arena around you. And I think, um, one of the things you can do is just start body scanning and getting used to knowing that you're there. And then from there, being able to feel your heart center um, and starting to feel that place so that you can start getting into a deeper place of, of union awareness um, with, uh, with God, with the divine. So um, I, that's what, those are some of the, like, I think the most basic ones that people can start with, but that are also extremely effective. And one of my, one of the things I will say, if, you know, if you're starting off is tamper your expectations and just allow yourself to just sit for 10, 15 minutes and just keep building. I think a lot of people expect, okay, you know, they're going to have some sort of like out of body experience within like, even if they sit for an hour and then they get disappointed that they don't have this life changing experience. And then they just say, yeah, it's not for me, but that's not, uh, that's not how it works. Um, and eventually things do come, but, um, being able to temper your expectations and allow yourself to, uh, to go into the transformative experience, um, will allow you to, um, will open the doors that you're looking for, for experience will begin to open as you actually sit and practice. Um, so, now, is, uh, is it about patient, experience patient, or, or is experience just us articulating what we're feeling? What do you think? Because people say, oh, say you guys again. are just, is it about experience or the idea of experience is us articulating what I felt, what I'm sensing? Because uh, people will quickly say, 
you guys are just chasing an experience, chasing an yeah. encounter, and you're going to end up in Eastern mysticism, chasing angels or demons or something like that. So what, yeah, what no, do you mean for by sure. I mean, I was speaking, I guess, mainly from knowing audience base that, that you know, our generation this day and age <laughs> is definitely looking for experiences. So, yeah. uh, which is why I was saying just, Hey, relax, just start to go into the practice and allow it to transform. But yeah, you, you, what you start to realize is that even when you're just working with your, your Hey, I quieted myself and I learned this specific aspect of myself and you start to do these things, you realize that these very profound things are actually very simple in the way that you end up sort of engaging and sort of unfolding and starting to understand these inner processes that are taking place within you um, as you um, as you sit within it. Like, have you ever actually sat and tried to deal with boredom? Mm. You know, most of the time then we just hop on our phone, but have you actually overcome boredom? You know, that's a very interesting thing to, to actually deal with, with inside yourself. But most people, we aren't, we aren't even aware of that now, but of course you, that'll come up in meditation, um, you know, depending on what you're doing in the meditational practice. But, uh, so there are these profound transformations and sort of connections that we can get deeper with the spirit as we enter into these things and allow it to transform us. And, or as Paul would say, being transformed by, you know, the image of Christ and some, you know, what we're allowing that, um, the energy of the Holy spirit or the divine to come in and to allow it to reshape our entire, uh, awareness in our, in, in our field. And what then comes out of that is actually a transformed world. And then your world actually begins to shift according to these sort of things that start to take place, but it just starts with sitting. Um, and these things start to unfold. Um, so what are you, so, there, so there's this, um, for me, I'll say this, um, intention going in, I want to meet with an angel today. I want to do this. I want to do that. Right. There's all kinds of different intentions. I want money. I want this. Um, I, it's been, it's just been a practice of mine. Um, and not saying this is the only practice or, or what you need to do or have to do, but, um, just to go in and just spend time with God. Right. And say, okay, father, what is it that, that you have for me? You know, I'm open to whatever you have. I'm open to all of the things I just mentioned. I'm open to angels. I'm open to, um, you know, inspiration. I'm open to be taught. I'm open to repent. Like I'm open to whatever. What do you have for me? And it's that that song and dance of just getting into like communication where you have my undivided attention. I'm not cooking dinner. I'm not driving in my car. Listen, I'm stopping and I'm going within. It's special. Something happens um, to go in and, and just ask him and then go into that experience, go into that encounter. Um, should we preface it with an expectation or either or what is what do you think is the the best way to do it i will I say feel, that i feel like going in with the i'm gonna go it's meet a great my, question meet an angel today and the angel doesn't show up and then you're like oh kind of thing yeah or I, you like make I, up I, an I, angel I, with the mind like you know totally but it depends on the capacity of the person and it depends on what they know how to do if they like you who knows how to engage certain things and open up with it, then of course, definitely. Um, but there are a lot of people that just don't know how to unlock any of those things. And so they, you know, if they say, Hey, I want to meet an angel, they may expect like literally for something to show up physically, but room, they don't yeah, understand, sure. you know, like, Hey, there's, there's this inner process that happens as you know, that you can just engage within yourself. And then, it, then you can, you can do it basically almost on command. Um, but, uh, so I think it depends on the individual and where they're at and what, just what, what they have the ability to do. Um, and so for what me, is it for you? Okay, go ahead. Yeah. Go ahead. No, no, go ahead. No, I was going to say, what is it? What is it for you? Like, are you able, like, what are some of the profound encounters that made you like that, like left an impression? Because if, if you have a meditation practice, it could be like, it could become a religious routine at some points as well, unless the the ground is shaken right these and we hear about the holy spirit the outpouring and it like this you know it, it it leaves a mark on you have there been those times of like where an angel does show up in the room or an angel or a, a, a 
in meditation, a feeling of love comes up over you, weeping, seeing Jesus, a light coming into your vision, leaving your body, traveling the cosmos. What is some of the experiences that, that you've had that have been profound to let you know that there's there's some there's gold here, I would say? Yeah. Oh, uh, gosh. I mean, there's so many that yeah. it's kind of hard to kind of let me just think of one that I can just pull is, is, out. Is, that I feel is like it's all important. of that that I just said a part of it? <laughs> yeah, for sure. So it's just kind of like, I mean, again, you know, uh, being under, you know, a, a good uh, Jewish teacher, one of the things that we, you know, we try to do, I try to do at least to a certain extent is not, well, I don't mind sharing experiences and I'll share, maybe I'll share one, but um, uh, just because I don't want people to, it's a good way of being able to kind of move your being into certain things that you want to do. But um, so you kind of have to, you're kind of putting me in a good way. You're putting me on the spot. Cause I do kind of like to defer sometimes. Um, yeah. And that's, answer. that's, you know, humility and well, it's also not kissing and telling as well, you know, like, Hey, what you guys yeah. do in the bedroom? I, and I, there's that part of it as well, dude, for sure. Yeah, I know for sure. Um, yeah, I would say, um, man, I would say, let's see, what would be a really fun one to share? That'd be interesting for people. Um, I think the first, I'll just say the first one that came to mind. That's the one I think I'll probably work with. So, um, a few years ago I was in meditation and, um, I actually went through a marginal exercise actually within myself to begin with where, uh, I was having Jesus teach me a certain, you know, meditation technique. And he walked me through this specific technique and, um, it was actually really weird because my mind, the awareness of my being actually shifted from this sort of like embodied sort of like, you know, you're like here in this space to this uh, sort of like connected, all connected outside myself space. But this happened, you know, not necessarily on um, people have these sort of experiences on, you know, we've talked about like psychedelics and stuff mm -hmm. like this, but this happened during actually like only after like maybe like 10 minutes of meditation, I went boop and I was like completely just expansive, boop, 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 like fully awake in the experience. Um, and it was so blissful. I just wanted to stay there forever. I, I just felt like a an infinite uh, unfolding um I don't know really the word balloon in some capacities are, and it just, just kept going and going, going, going. Um, but what it, what it did. And then when, and then I came back and why this was important to me or what was interesting about it, at least for myself was that, um, it allowed me to, uh, get a better understanding of the sort of process with how my soul, um, condenses itself into what I experience as myself as Taylor. And it kind of gave me the inverse experience of moving up and then coming back into this sort of like cone. Um, it was like a movement expansion, but then it kind of coned back. And when it coned back, um, I was able to kind of feel uh, the sort of sense that um, when I imagine maybe even what an infant feels like when it's sort of like soul self is like moving from this sort of like pushing outwards, but maybe moving more towards this um, condensed form of an individual that starts to happen over a period of time. Um, but it was, you know, like a 15 minute thing. I think that's kind of an interesting one. I mean, there's a whole host of things, but um I think the most, the thing that I've learned through my experiences along the way is that, um, I will give you, I will give people a hot tip here. If you want to, uh, I will say that my experiences that were usually the most profound or the most interesting came from the times where I was the most passive. And what I mean by passive is that I wasn't creating anything within myself and it mm. takes a while and you have to sit in it. Okay. Um, but if was you're it, willing would you, to sit Now, would you that, say like focusing on the blackness in front of you? What, like, what is that? Or is that just 
Yeah. And just literally just sitting and being and watching. That's pretty much all uh, I do, and, to be honest with you. Yeah. And yeah. and because you then you actually start to see uh, the word meta beyond beyond this sort of world sort of realities. You start to see uh, dimensions, beings, so on. It's angels, whatever you want to call, you know, angels, different aspects. You, you can feel yourself move into different places. Um, but most, most people are pretty impatient with the process. So, um, but if you can, but it's a good thing, but if you can develop it, um, you're going to move beyond just like, Hey, I had this imaginal experience with, with so-and-so or this or that, which is fine. Um, but is it this though? sort of, is it, it takes, though? it takes a little bit of practice. Let, let's talk about that just really quick. Cause there's this, you know, weird thing of like the imaginal thing. And you said that at the beginning, you know, that of the meditation journey anyway, of like Jesus came and taught me this experience, or I want you to see Jesus coming to you. Like I, I lead guided meditations and there's that yeah, feeling I've, there's, there's an impression with the imagination that it really happened, that Jesus was really there, that I, ascended and went into the courtrooms of heaven like i have those guided meditations they're extremely powerful i was there when i wrote them um it definitely has that impact but the the language of imaginal right do, do we get to say that brother I, there were 17 angels there with me and they and they taught me how to do this like because I, I i i feel like we're in that realm of 17 angels literally coming to you in a in a moment and then the I imagined 17 angels, and now I get to write books on that imaginal experience being so impactful. I feel like the, the waters get muddy to be like, oh, there's an angel, there's an angel, there's an angel, versus like, hold on, when an angel comes, the room and the walls will vibrate kind of thing. You know, you y'all know you know what I'm saying. In this movement, there's so many, okay, what do you see? Yeah. Wow, 17 angels, like instantly kind of thing. And it takes me, yeah. maybe it's prideful because I have to go through a process and waiting and go through lights exactly. and stuff to get there. And I don't want to. No, I, I think that that is one of the most destructive things that I think is in the mystic movement. It's a language around it at this point. Um, based I, like, on I like that you prefaced it with it though, with the imaginal. Yeah. But not saying yeah, that's so, not as real or as powerful. I want to say that too. Exactly. And not saying it's not. Um, I mean, my book, I wrote this book called, or in the Beginner's Guide to Christian Meditation, we talked about, but there's a chapter called The Image Sensorium, um, which is what I call the place that images come into the mind. Um, and basically, I wrote ba the book for that chapter. I wrote that chapter wow. first because um, that was the most important thing because I was seeing so many people you know, someone, you know, you may go to a conference and someone says, yeah, I go to heaven a thousand times a day. Yeah. And, you know, I hung out with Abraham and yeah. Enoch yesterday <laughs> for four hours. But what, when people are listening, they think, oh my God, this person is like outside themselves and they're really having these things. But what they don't realize is that they just are using the imaginal capacity to have this engagement with this archetypal energy force that's now flowing into their consciousness. Um, and it's, this informational field coming from these, you know, uh, whoever it is. So, um, but, uh, yeah, the, the conversation around this has to be, we, so I call the imaginal that where you, so if I say, imagine a tree and you create a tree in your mind, mm -hmm. that's what I call the imaginal. Now, there's going to be your own inspiration on what that tree is. I didn't say a palm tree. I didn't say what type of tree. I didn't say, you know, it needs to be this. Now in your own mind, a tree came into you. Now in this, in this creative process, that's the inspiration that comes in. Um, and that, that becomes uh, re revelatory. However, you have to know your being. You have to know when you're talking with something to a certain extent, is this just my ego? And if it is, yeah. then you have to be able to sense that. Mm -hmm. Um, and, but then the other side of it on the other pole, I call the visional and the visional is the passive capacity to enter into mystical experiences, which is what you're talking about, where you actually have to sit and it takes time and it takes work. But, um, 
And what I mean by work is that you have, it does, it's not just two minutes. You have to like sit maybe for half an hour, 45 minutes or an hour. Now, obviously there's certain things you can do with breath work to kind of like cheat code it and get, you know, you can hack things, but um, for the most part, it requires, uh, it, it requires more time. However, the sort of things that arise from them are a very different than the sort of imaginal, like, Hey, you know, Enoch came to me and he looks like someone from the medieval period or something, you know, like that with like a sword and whatever. And it, immediately when people start talking, I know immediately what sort of process that they went through to have their experience based on mm -hmm. what they saw. Cause you know, when you see something that is outside of the sort of like context of this mm -hmm. sort of imaginal thing that we're kind of in, which is kind of this like European, uh, neo, I don't know, like, uh, kingdom sort of like imagery that we use a lot of times. Mm -hmm. Um, when you're, when you're outside of that and you move into the sort of visional things, what you see is beyond, uh, you know, it's like, yeah, it was like this Sacred flying, geometry? yeah, it's like, yeah, it's Mist. like this flying flower thing with neon petals and they're spinning different it's like you don't have you're, you're trying to describe yeah, certain you have things. to make it look a certain way like i mean even with the just throw it out there really quick the jesus experience he came to me and i would say he usually looks like me but i don't have my beard and i look different but they say yeah he, long flowing hair and a beautiful beard i mean that's the image that we were given to say, okay, that energy looks like this, or a demon looks like people are asking about your experiences with grace. Because uh, you've watched movies, you've seen them as invaders, you've seen them as this. So you see a gray and immediately it's a demon, you know, you, which the energy speaks through impressions almost telepathically as well, like these feelings in your body. Mm -hmm. Bliss. I mean, there's so much that, that goes, the, the realms are very slippery for us to try to articulate. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I think, um, that's part of the big reason I went into like learning what you do as well. And like reading and stuff is that when you actually move outside of the structures of what, you know, and you start having experiences, you do go to people that, you know, that were like masters at certain things like, uh, you know, a Plotinus who was a great Greek contemplative that talked about the overflowing emanative aspect of God and how it moves down into these sort of, um, you know, these, these sort of buckets of reality, um, and so you do kind of like, okay, you, you, you do, you do kind of go into these sort of places to, to, to kind of help you work through, you know, what you're, what you're trying to see. The imaginal is extremely powerful and it's, it's extremely useful and I use it every day. Um, uh, but there is definitely a difference between the imaginal experience and a visual experience. And, mm -hmm. um, and then a physical experience, Which is different because we mentioned. And then a kinda, physical experience, kind of scoffed that yeah, the angel's gonna appear next to you. There's just like, no, they can, like for sure, yeah. and don't, but, but not even where only you see it, because that's maybe even also engaging totally. the imagination with the eyes open, which right. there, there's room for that. There's room. Totally, in I don't, and I don't have a problem with that body, but like literally, like everyone sees it. You gotta see that little man right there, yeah. right? Those kind of things, and. uh Man, I, I love it yeah, all. It's all out of body experiences or anything. There's a whole host of things that start to, you know, happen. So, but yeah, man, I want to keep going with you, bro, because I just want to pick your brain and maybe we'll do a part two. Uh, do it soon, okay. just so we can continue. Yeah, no I gotta go because I got I got a, another engagement with a with a uh, somebody's interview. I mean, they they do have it scheduled, so um, okay, I'd like to. Well. I need to jump on that. But man, I enjoyed connecting with you, and um, I yeah. know the, the the audience liked you as well. Um, Many people know who you are. So obviously, yeah, we do run in the same circles as I'm reading here. And uh, we'll come back and do another one, tap into some of the questions because people do have a lot of questions. I've tried to weave some of them throughout the conversation. Um, cool. But but let people know where they can check out your book, man, and uh, check out your work and, and all that you're doing that you're bringing to the table. Yeah. Um, my website is ruach.com, R-O-O-A-K-H.com. Um, you can search a beginner's guide to Christian meditation on Amazon. You can get my book there, or you can just come to my website and then there's an Amazon link there. Uh, it's on Amazon all over the world. Um, so, or whatever you can get it like in South Africa, New Zealand, whatever. So, um, but yeah, so check I'm on Ruach. Um, and yeah, so if you're, you know, want to hop in on weekly practice, uh, you know, 
feel free to hop on. So Ruach, is that an app or is it your website? It's my website. Okay. And so you do it from the website? Yeah. Cool. Nice, nice, nice. It almost yeah. sounded like, yeah, hop on Ruach. I'm over there on that platform. And stream. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, maybe, maybe. I'm prophesying. So, yeah. <laughs> it's going yeah. to turn into something. Yeah. Hey, man, uh, really, really appreciate it, man. Me and me, you know, we just kind of get to, get to travel and go places and, and roll ideas off of and, um, you know, and we can keep going. And so I definitely want to do it again, man. Thank you for, for hanging out. Means a lot. No worries, bro. Thanks. Thanks for having me. Thanks to everyone for listening and appreciate it. And uh, have a great rest of your day and have a great next interview. Amen. Appreciate you, bro. Shalom.